<laughs> okay, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Eric Hansen from the University of Sherbrooke, who will talk on post-set topology of white subcategories. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. I really enjoy this event and I'm happy to be speaking at it this year. And thank you also to everyone who came to, to listen to my talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk just very briefly about um, one result from a paper I wrote with Emily Barnard that's on the archive since September. Um, so just to set some notation and terminology, um, lambda is just going to be a finite dimensional algebra over some field, K. The field is never going to really come up in this talk. Mod lambda, the category of finitely generated left modules. Um, as Bethany defined, uh, a module M is going to be called tau rigid if HOM of M to the Auslander right in translation of M is zero. Uh, and then I'm going to define a subcategory, so I just wrote subset, but of a full subcategory closed under isomorphisms uh, is going to be called wide if it's closed under extensions, kernels, and co-kernels. Another way to say this is that it's an abelian subcategory and it has the same X1. Um, wide of lambda is going to be the, the post set. It's, it's actually, it has a lattice structure, but for now post set is fine, of wide subcategories where the order is given by inclusion of subcategories. And for a wide subcategory W, I'll use this notation rank of W to be the number of simple objects in W. And for a module, I'll use the rank to mean the number of indecomposable direct summands. Okay, so since this is only a 10 minute talk, I'm going to make some simplifying assumptions. So as is, I think, pretty common, when I say module, I really do mean basic module. I'm going to assume my algebra is tau tilting finite. So the two things that um, I'm taking away from that are that there are finitely many basic tau rigid modules and that there are finitely many wide subcategories. And then the last assumption is um, pretty strong and you can get rid of it, but it just requires some more work, is that I'm going to assume that every indecomposable tau rigid module is also a brick. Um, so in particular, by the brick tau rigid correspondence of Daemone Yamahaso, this is saying that my bricks and my indecomposable tau rigid modules are the same. And again, this is just to simplify the, the exposition a little bit. Okay, so a theorem um, that was um, Part of this comes from um, a result of, of Hasso and then also Daemon Iyama reading Wrighton and Thomas, is that given a wide subcategory, there exists some tau rigid module where we can write W as this uh, tau perpendicular category first defined by Hasso. Um, so I use M perp intersect perp tau M. Um, this is the, the same definition as, as Bethany gave. So there's no, um, non-zero maps from M to modules in W. There's no non-zero maps from modules in W to tau of M. Uh, and then there exists a finite dimensional algebra. I called it lambda W and an exact equivalence of categories between W and the module category of this lambda W. And the, the rank has this nice property where the rank of our wide subcategory is equal to the rank of our algebra minus the rank of our tau rigid module M. So just two quick notes. Uh, the way I stated this is really only true for tau tilting finite algebras. There is a statement um, for general algebras, but it's not exactly this one. And um, the equivalence of categories here induces an order preserving bijection between those wide subcategories, which are contained in W, and the wide subcategories of this other algebra, lambda sub w. OK, so my simplified definition um, is kind of this relative Hasso reduction studied by Bethany and Oslock. So if we take n in w, um, so they would probably say it should be support tau rigid or tau rigid in w. By my assumption, I can just say n is a brick then I can define the Hasso reduction of N in W to be the intersection of W with N perp and perp tau W N, where tau W now is the AR translation in mod lambda W. So it might be different from the AR translation in the original algebra. 
And this theorem, which, which led to the unique completion result that Bethany showed us, is that if I take two wide subcategories V and W, and their rank differs by only one, then there is a unique uh, brick in the bigger wide subcategory so that we can write the smaller wide subcategory as this, um, this tau perpendicular subcategory of that brick. And the way I want to see this fact is I want to see this as a way of labeling uh, the minimal relations in this post set of wide subcategories by bricks. And instead of defining what I mean by labeling, I just have an example here. So we take the just A2. Here's my AR quiver. There are five wide subcategories. We can take everything. We can take just direct sums of copies of any one in decomposable, and we can take just the zero object. Those are the only wide subcategories. And then if we look at this right path first, so I labeled this inclusion by S2 because um, out of P2 is the tau perpendicular category of S2. And then to go down to the bottom, I labeled this by P2 because we, in this wide subcategory out of P2, we can take the tau perpendicular category of P2 and we get down to the bottom. And so the other labels here are, are determined analogously. Okay, so uh, Bethany nicely already gave the definition of a tau exceptional sequence, but what I'm calling a definition proposition, since it's not the original definition, uh, is that a tau exceptional sequence, uh, I index mine uh, right to left rather than left to right, is a chain of these labels of the, the post set wide lambda, which start at the top. Um, and so just a, a note for emphasis is we're reading tau exceptional sequences right to left. So M1 is the thing that comes first in my notation. So going back to our example, here we have the, the same picture as before, and there are uh, seven tau exceptional sequences. So um, S2P2 comes from reading the labels down like this. Um, P1S2 from there. P2, P1 from here. We could also take just one label. Again, we have to start at the top. So we get those three, and then you could take the empty tau exceptional sequence as well. Okay, so an informal definition, just so I can kind of state the, the main result. We're going to take a total order on the set of bricks of mod lambda, and we're going to call this total order an EL structure on this post set uh, wide of lambda if a couple properties hold. So the first one, for any wide subcategory W, we need there to be a unique tau exceptional sequence which ends at W and is increasing with respect to this partial order. And by increasing, I again mean when we, when we read um, right to left. So in the example, um, Here's the partial order I took. We have S2 less than P1, less than P2. And so um, S2 then P2 is a, a tau exceptional sequence that's increasing because we start at S2 and then we go to P2. Um, P1 S2 is um, not increasing and P2 P1 is also not increasing. So here we do have that unique tau exceptional sequence ending at the bottom that's increasing. The second one is that this chain has to be minimal at each step in some precise sense related to the lexicographic order. So for example, here where S2, P2 is our increasing chain, it's saying that S2 like really had to be the smallest thing in our partial order. Otherwise that couldn't have been our increasing chain. It's, it's a technical condition. And so you might say, okay, this is a fine definition, but why? Um, should we care about such a thing? And I, I guess I'll tell you the theorem and then some, some motivation for, for why we would study such things. So I'm going to suppose that the transitive closure of the relation um, where we set M less than N, if HOM of MN is non-zero, restricted only to the bricks is acyclic. Um, so for example, if lambda is representation directed, 
um, that by definition means that this relation on all indecomposables is acyclic, then it would certainly satisfy this property. Um, and if this happens, then this, uh, this post-set wide lambda admits an EL structure. And so our corollary slash motivation is that when an EL structure exists, it implies that the what's called the order complex, a simpushal complex formed by the chains of our post set, um, is a shellable simpushal complex. So in particular, it has the homotopy type of a wedge sum of spheres, for example, is one property. And so, for example, by looking at um, hereditary algebras, this actually extends um, what's known as a type-free EL labeling of the lattices of non-crossing partitions, which was first proved by um, Athanasiadis, Brady, and Watt. So it's related to some, some deep combinatorics is I guess the point of this slide. And just to conclude, uh, an open question slash some future work is whether EL structures always exist. We're in a pretty special case where we have this acyclic order on the bricks coming from Hom. Um, for pre-projective algebras of type A, the answer is yes. Um, these do not have this um, Hom relation being acyclic. But I, I'm uh, in work in progress with Xin Wei Yu. We describe a, an EL structure for these pre-projective algebras combinatorially. And there's also a different EL labeling um, that Aaron Ban Bancroft um, wrote about in 2011. So with that, I am out of time. Thank you very much.